case you're uncertain, this is the panel on cost-benefit analysis. Um, I regret to say uh, that one of our panelists can't make it, Lisa Heinzerling. Um, you, may, you may get some idea of where she would have been positioned by the title of the uh, book of which she is co-author, Priceless on Knowing the Price of Everything and the Value of Nothing. Um, so I'm very disappointed that she can't be here to uh, present the position which is suggested by that title. Uh, but we do have three remaining distinguished panelists, uh, all of whom have familiarity with the area. And I'll say a, a brief word uh, about each of them, and then they will proceed to talk for six to eight minutes uh, in the sequence indicated here, moving out from me. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. There's there lots of room up front. <laughs> <laughs> None of the students want to go up front. That's well known. Um, do people miss the unfortunate news that Lisa Heinzelin can't make it? They did miss it? No. No, okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, all right, so a, a word about each of the panelists. Um, Daryl Josepher has served as deputy, principal deputy solicitor general and also uh, assistant to the solicitor general and uh, argued 11 cases and briefed more than 100. Uh, and uh, was also deputy general counsel of the office of OMB, of, of OMB uh, and he is now at King and & Spaulding and, and has experience in these matters. Uh, Lisa Heinzling, unfortunately, I must, I must skip. Michael Lip, excuse me, my papers, here we are. Uh, Michael Livermore is a co-author with uh, Ricky Rivez of Retaking Rationality, How Cost-Benefit Analysis Can Better Protect the Environment and Our Health. Uh, and he is executive director of the Institute for Public Policy Integrity at NYU School of Law. He clerked for my colleague, Mary Edwards and also worked for uh, New York Public Interest Research Group, NY Peer, uh, and was a managing editor of the NYU Law Review. Uh, and Susan Dudley is now director of the George Washington University Regulatory Studies Center, uh, but she was administrator of OIRA, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in OMB, uh, for approximately two years. Uh, and before that was Director of Regulatory Studies at Mercatus Center at George Mason. Uh, so we're very happy to have the three. Because of the absence of Lisa Heinzerling and because of the expectation that she would have been the uh, most ardent critic of cost-benefit analysis, in the question period I will give uh, a very strong preference to questions by people who at least promise at the outset that <laughs> they will criticize, attack, whatever, cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> criticize, attack, whatever, in the form of a question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. uh, Thank you, Judge Williams, and thanks everyone else for having me. Um, as many of you know, in the, in the D.C. Circuit, the time limits are kind of flexible. Your red light comes on and you really get to keep going. Uh, but <laughs> Judge, Judge Williams was very clear um, that we will not be following D.C. Circuit procedure here. Um, so I'll be brief because it's, it's bad to annoy a judge when you're actually trying to get something. It's pointless to annoy a judge when there's really nothing to be gained at all. <laughs> um, but uh, so I quickly just want to start off with two things. One is just what is cost-benefit analysis for, for the sake of anyone who's now wondering why they wandered into this room. And the second is uh, the legal landscape um, for agencies' consideration of it after the Supreme Court's decision in Riverkeeper this past April. Um, in terms of what it is, I mean, I, looking at this group, I'm pretty sure you all know, so I'll be brief on this. Cost-benefit analysis is really just a matter of figuring out whether the pros outweigh the cons, uh, whether the reasons to do something uh, are better than the reasons not to do it, whether the benefits exceed the, the disbenefits or the harms from doing it. We all do it routinely in, in daily life. Most of us could surely upgrade the smoke detectors in our homes or apartments to be a little better, a little more protective of safety. Um, 
it may be the reason I haven't done it is just procrastination. Um, but for the most part, you know, the reason we don't upgrade them is that we've at least implicitly decided that the extra cost of a slightly better smoke detector is just not worth it in terms of the slightly better safety results you'd get. It's the same with cars. Most of us could afford more expensive and safer cars. The reason we don't spend the extra money on the extra safe cars that we've at least implicitly decided it's not worth it. So as long as we all do this in, in daily decision making, it only seems fair to ask the government to do the same when it's either telling us what to do or spending our money for us. Um, in terms of the legal landscape for this, there are basically three scenarios. Uh, sometimes Congress specifically directs an agency to do a cost-benefit analysis, which is easy. Uh, sometimes it unambiguously tells the agency not to, um, in which circumstances the Congress has essentially done the cost-benefit analysis itself, or at least it should have. Um, one example there is that the Clean Air Act requires nationwide air quality standards that are requisite to protect the public health with an adequate margin of safety. Uh, and the Supreme Court held in the American trucking case a while back ago that requisite to protect the public health does not admit of cost-benefit analysis. You do what's necessary regardless of the consequences, and we hope that Congress had thought that through ahead of time. The, the far more common situation, though, is that Congress will prescribe a statutory standard that is somewhat unclear, has some ambiguity, has some play in the joints. And for a while, it had been thought um, based on some loose language in a couple of earlier Supreme Court cases, the cost-benefit analysis might be somehow disfavored, such that an agency could do a cost-benefit analysis only if the statute clearly authorized it. There was at least language to that effect in a couple of Supreme Court decisions. Uh, in Riverkeeper this past April, the Supreme Court put that to bed um, and held that consistent with normal principles of, of ad law, there's nothing special about cost-benefit analysis, consistent with normal principles, if a statute's ambiguous, if it's, if it's vague on a particular, uh, as to the standard for, for promulgating a, uh, a standard or, or a regulation, uh, that the agency then has discretion to do cost-benefit analysis. It doesn't have to, but it has discretion. Uh, which means that going forward, under most of the environmental statutes, the agencies have authority to do or not do cost-benefit analysis. The trick, of course, for them now is that if they're not going to do a cost-benefit analysis, they have to provide a reasoned explanation of why they'd like to do something that would cause more harm than good or at least why they would be indifferent to whether their standard would do more harm than good. Um, and I'm, I'm confident that they're up to the task and that DOJ will, will, will find ways to defend this. Um, but it does put more pressure on the agencies to either do sensible things or come up with reasons not to. Um, the other thing that's significant about the Riverkeeper case is that the statutory standard there um, required st uh, standards for, for some water intake structures at power plants that were based on the best technology available for minimizing adverse environmental impact. And the first time you hear that standard, the best technology available for minimizing adverse environmental impact, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of wiggle room there. You, you want to guess that that's really a great place to go do a, a, you know, a, a straight up cost benefit analysis. Um, but there was some wiggle room in the government, we argued there was and we won. So now that it's been established that that standard admits of cost benefit analysis, I think it's fair to say that most will. Um, which is, I think, legally the significant point going forward. Very <laughs> <laughs>